The following program is a KYNE TV production in cooperation with UNO Television. Funding for The War Comes to Nebraska was provided by the Victory 95 World War II 50th Anniversary Commemorative Celebration Program. The decade of the 40s opened quietly in Nebraska. A generation of young people danced to big band sounds, worried about dates and jobs. Few of them thought about a college degree. Their elders sold insurance, worked for the railroads or the packing houses, farmed and kept hoping the depression was really behind them. Despite the first peacetime draft and the ominous news from Asia and Europe, the war seemed far away. Some felt the United States would eventually enter the growing conflict. None could have guessed the impact a few short years would have. World War II would require a total commitment that unified the state as well as the entire country, unlike any time before or since. Virtually everyone was touched as citizens became soldiers. Defense workers produced the hardware of war. Farmers and ranchers fed people around the world. Children gathered scrap metal and everyone drastically altered their lifestyle to support the uncontested just cause. As high as the price of victory was, few would dispute the cost. Experiences would be remembered with humor, with horror, but most of all, with pride. No one would know that the effects of the conflict and their contributions would change their lives and the world forever. Newspapers reported Japan's surge into China and Hitler's annexations of Austria and Czechoslovakia. But most Nebraskans, battling for their own survival against the Depression and ongoing droughts, had little interest in Europe or Asia. I think we were generally fairly complacent here. I know in, in the 30s, late 30s, I was in high school dancing to Glenn Miller music and knowing that something was going on in Europe, but not touching me at all. As the 1930s turned into the 40s, Hitler's tactics changed from political annexation to military invasion. Poland, Holland, Belgium, and Luxembourg fell, and the mighty French army was conquered with ease. England appeared next. Speculation about the United States being drawn into the war was growing, but the country stayed technically neutral. Most Nebraskans seemed to agree with this position. Farmers were more concerned with recovering from the depression and droughts. The newly formed unicameral wrestled with improving the economy. The state's large German population was generally anti-Nazi, but were openly opposed to a war with the land of their ancestors and relatives. Most Nebraskans were content to let Europe solve its own problems. Washington's perspective was different. The federal government did not think the country could remain neutral and preparations for war were underway. The draft continued and America began to supply our future allies with excess materials. To bolster military readiness, President Roosevelt activated 18 National Guard divisions for one year of preparedness training. One of them, the 35th, included soldiers from many Nebraska communities. In late December of 1940, the division began its 12-month activation. Increasing military aircraft production was also being closely evaluated by the government. Both coasts were considered vulnerable to air attack. If possible, new defense plants and military installations were to be built in the area between the Appalachian and Rocky Mountains, also known as the Citadel of Defense. To take advantage of this, a shrewd group of planners was working hard to bring an aircraft plant to the Omaha area. Back in the 30s, they formed what was known as the Aviation 
Chamber of Commerce to bring aviation businesses to Omaha. They saw aviation as being a major uh, business in the future uh, and in transportation. In the sense, Omaha was a center of other transportation industries. They thought that it would be a good uh, location for aviation industries as well. The effort to bring an aircraft plant to Omaha was successful. In early December of 1940, the Glen L. Martin Company of Baltimore announced it would build and operate a bomber factory in Omaha. The facility would be built at Fort Crook, now off at Air Force Base. When ground was broken in March of 1941, Martin had a letter of intent from the U.S. government to build 1,200 B-26 medium bombers. Known as the Marauder, the B-26 was able to carry more bombs than the B-17 at the blazing speed of 300 miles per hour. As work on the building proceeded, the Corps of Engineers used every means at their disposal to maintain their daunting timetable. Everyone was on the same team. Uh, the, not only the, the uh, builders, but the designers were working around the clock shifts to produce the, the drawings. And they literally built something that you drew the day before on this project. It was that fast. When the plant was finally complete, 25 full-size football fields could fit inside. 250 miles of electrical wiring had been installed. 47,000 cubic yards of concrete poured, five acres of glass, 10 miles of fluorescent tube lighting in the basement alone, and 10 million square feet of paint had been applied. As this country moved toward the final month of 1941, we were still a nation on the periphery of war. On December 7th, ironically the same day the main drive to the Martin bomber plant was dedicated, all this changed. Quite well, I, my wife and I were living in Orleans, Nebraska. I was working for the Federal Land Bank at the time as, as a, um, a, a field man, and um, we had company, uh, and uh, we didn't have the radio on. And I, after our company had left to go home, uh, I went over to our, the minister's house, and uh, Mrs. Reed told me that Pearl Harbor had been, been bombed, and it was it was a terrible shock. Uh, it, it seemed like something just unbelievable. My mother told us, hurry, hurry, President Roosevelt's talking. We must listen. So we all put our ear by the little radio, and it wasn't very loud, and we couldn't get it to go louder, so we had to practically put our ear right to where the speaker was coming from. And he had told us Pearl Harbor was just bombed. And he says, that will be war. They bombed Pearl Harbor. I remember Pearl Harbor uh, as a result of being stationed at Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. And uh, on the afternoon of that day, uh, at about 2 p.m. in the afternoon, I was in the theater, believe it or not, watching a movie. And uh, someone walked out onto the stage and simply gave the order, everyone must report back to their unit immediately. I was 16 years old, and I was in a movie theater. I had convinced a young lady to, that I could take her to a movie, and she said, as long as it's gone with the wind. And that's where we were, up in the balcony that afternoon, when in the middle of the movie, the movie stopped, the house lights came up, and a big notice put up on the screen, Pearl Harbor was just bombed. Well, naturally, as a 16-year-old, and my limited knowledge of of where we're, you know, the world, we all ask, where in the hell is Pearl Harbor? When Pearl Harbor was attacked, I was 
living in a house on Reddick Avenue, and my dad was a lieutenant colonel in the Army, and I happened to be listening to the radio when the news came across, and my father was in another room with a friend of his also in the service, and I called him in to listen. And I remember, I was in the ROTC at the time, so I knew that this was something I had listened to seriously, and I also thought about my father, of course. And um, I remember how soberly we sat there on the floor and listened to that broadcast. We were at church out at Nebraska Wesleyan, and coming home that noon, uh, then we heard the news. And I remember the house mother came out with a little flag and and started to sob, and she said, well, you boys won't be around here very long, quite a few of you. So that was in December of 41, and I enlisted in February of 42. We were driving to Carnell on that day, and it was a bad day. I, I mean, the, the weather was bad, uh, it, and the little car that we had, uh, I didn't think it was going to even make it out of Omaha, let alone go all the way to Kearney. But on our way, as we were halfway along on the trip, and all of a sudden we hear on the radio that President Roosevelt had declared war on Japan. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. On December 11th, Congress took just six and a half minutes to declare war on Japan, as well as Germany and Italy. In Nebraska, as elsewhere, young men flooded the enlistment centers. Before the war was over, nearly 140,000 Nebraska men and women would be part of the armed forces, a military machine that numbered 12 million at its peak. American opposition to involvement in the war essentially disappeared with the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was really a total commitment by everybody. The people on the home front were doing things, the people working in defense industries. Everybody was committed to this. There, if there was any uh, resistance, it was so minor that it never even surfaced. And you didn't think of doing anything else except getting into the service. And I don't know if it was a big romantic adventure, but it was, it was a duty type of thing. And we'll never have that again. I think all of us thought that, uh, hey, here goes, here goes our life. And um, uh, it wasn't a, a sad thing at all. I mean, uh, in some cases, I suppose it was, well, I may have this last semester in college, or I may not. And uh, if, if they choose to take me, that's fine. Every time I turn around, a young gentleman come to my door and says, I'm going. I've enlisted. My country needs me. And they bid us farewell. In the first few months following Pearl Harbor, there was little to cheer about. German U-boats were sinking ships in the Atlantic at an alarming rate. In the Pacific, Japan's conquest continued. They captured Hong Kong, Indochina, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Java, Burma, the Philippines, Guam, and Wake Island, as well as placing invasion troops in the Solomons and New Guinea. The remnants of the battered U.S. Pacific Fleet was all that stood between the Japanese and the west coast of the United States. Japan seemed unstoppable. The spring of 1942 brought three events that gave the country hope at a time when it needed it most. On April 18th, Lieutenant Colonel James H. Doolittle and his 16 B-25 bombers took off from the aircraft carrier Hornet. One of his pilots was Richard O. Joyce of Lincoln. Wave hopping toward the Japanese homeland and then flying at treetop level, they bombed military installations in Tokyo and then headed for China. The raid had little real military value, but it stunned the Japanese and boosted American morale immeasurably. In May, a large Japanese fleet steaming for Port Moresby, New Guinea, was intercepted by U.S. and Australian warships. The resulting Battle of the Coral Sea was the first naval engagement in history in which ships did not fire a single direct shot. Instead, the battle pitted evenly matched Japanese and U.S. carrier forces against each other. 
The tenacious and accurate American flyers forced the Japanese to retreat after sinking or disabling more than 25 ships. Port Moresby and Australia were secure. Japan had suffered its first tactical defeat and military aviation's enormous potential was becoming apparent. A month later, in early June, American naval aviators again struck a crippling blow to a vastly superior Japanese force in the Battle of Midway. U.S. carrier-based aircraft sank four Japanese carriers. Japan's war effort changed from an offensive thrust to a holding operation. For naval aviators like those who carried the day at Coral Sea and Midway, facing a well-equipped and experienced enemy was not their only challenge. A routine mission turned into something dramatically different for Nebraskan Byron Johnson when his Navy Hellcat fighter developed engine problems. The landing proved to be anything but routine. I hit in front of the first wire, it flew off into the guns and tried to, to clear the guns when I was out of control, but it just like a slingshot kind of threw the plane into the guns on the port side and the belly tank exploded. And the safety pin of the cockpit had sheared off. So I just couldn't get out. All I could see was flame and smoke. But Walter Tuning, the catapult officer, sprinted the length of the carrier deck and somehow stood on that flaming belly tank and then came up over the front of the wing and the emergency release and got me out. The successes in the Pacific emphasized the role military aviation would have in winning the war. Back in Nebraska, a series of Army airfields came to the state. Vigorous lobbying by Nebraska Senator George Norris and the state's terrain, climate, low-cost real estate, road and railway system, and reliable utilities caught the attention of the War Department. By late 1940, initial surveying of possible locations was underway. During the summer of 41, more thorough planning was done, and by the time the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, the War Department was essentially ready to begin. Military airfields were coming to Nebraska. Despite the economic boost and patriotic fervor brought on by Pearl Harbor, the announcement that airfields were going to be built wasn't good news for everyone. The first reaction was, where would they be at? The farmers, of course, were concerned because they were um, having to give up, uh, in most cases, around 2,000 acres of prime farm ground for the construction of these Army airfields. They were also given 30 days to um, get off the, uh, the property so construction could be uh, started. So there was a lot of uh, anxiety amongst the farming community about having these airfields come in. By March of 1942, site selections throughout the state were being announced. Joining the existing airstrip at Fort Crook were 11 new sites at Scotts Bluff, Alliance, Ainsworth, McCook, Kearney, Grand Island, Harvard, Fairmont, Bruning, Lincoln, and Scribner. Charged with building the airfields quickly and armed with a financial blank check, the Army Corps of Engineers implemented mobilization construction techniques. With standardized designs and relatively simple building practices, the airfields were generally operational within 90 days of groundbreaking. As the airfields became active, several hundred thousand airmen saw the Nebraska countryside through plexiglass canopies. The training that these air crews received in Nebraska were a, a secondary level. They had already been through primary training with uh, smaller aircraft and came to Nebraska with somewhat of a background in, in uh, aviation as far as uh, single engine and multi-engine. And when they made it to Nebraska, this was a, a secondary level of training, uh, proficiency training, uh, bringing all the crews together and working as a team. Most of the airfields trained bomber and fighter crews, but some of the bases had very specialized missions. Paratrooper and glider units practiced airborne invasion missions at Scotts Bluff, Alliance, and near Pine Ridge. 
Many soldiers that trained here would participate in the Normandy invasion. At the Lincoln Air Base, nearly 50,000 mechanics were trained during the war. The Scribner Airfield was also a major camouflage school. Compared to other similar bases, its runways and buildings were practically invisible from the air. They painted all the buildings at the base to look like a farmstead or like a small village. The uh, runways were, were painted uh, and uh, constructed in such a way with a covering that it looked like cornfields. So a uh, supposedly an enemy pilot flying over Scribner Army Airfield could not detect the airfield. The only problem with that is once you launch your own airplanes and uh, want to recover them, your own pilots have trouble finding that airfield also. As aviators trained in Nebraska went off to combat, people back home were making sacrifices of their own. Rationing affected every business, every farm, every family. People waited in long lines as sugar was in short supply, then coffee, shoes, nylons. Women painted their legs or wore cotton hose. Gasoline was also rationed. Three to five gallons a week was the low priority ration, and the speed limit was set at 35 miles per hour. Gasoline itself was not in short supply, even if you included our military needs. Uh, we had plenty of gasoline because most of it uh, was, uh, in the United States, the world's largest producer. The problem was tires and hence the government uh, made a restriction on the amount of driving that could be done because natural rubber was under the control of the Japanese. Rationing made getting ordinary items very difficult, but it was still better than the Depression. Probably they were able to handle it better, just from a psychological standpoint, because the Depression was terrible. Uh, I remember going to school and, and having maybe a dime in my pocket. My cousin and I had, had a room, and we had cooking privileges, and no money, or very little, not exactly no money, but very, very little. Uh, yeah, I think the Depression helped you, helped you uh, handle rationing without any question. The end result of rationing was the supplies that our military forces and allies needed to fight the war. We saw the piles of material. We, we were thankful for them. And had we not had them, we wouldn't have won the war, in my opinion. Uh, we, we outpowered the Germans, simply outgunned them, simply outmanpowered them, and, and simply outsupplied them. And uh, that's basically the secret of our, of our win, in my mind, during World War II. Civilians were involved in other ways, too. Volunteer air raid wardens kept an eye on the skies ready to sound the alert. Campaigns were waged to warn both military and civilians about maintaining silence about subjects that could affect the war effort, from discussing troop movements to talking about manufacturing plants. Nebraska also provided space and personnel to manufacture and store ammunition, like the ordnance plants at Meade and Grand Island, and the Naval Ammunition Depot at Hastings, which turned a small town into a city. At its peak, the Hastings facilities supplied 40% of the Navy's ammunition. The Ordnance Plant at Meade produced bombs, well over 100,000 of them. Smaller installations in and around Omaha built tanks and steel compartments, shells, fuses, grenades, parachutes, guns and torpedo parts, plastic bombs, first aid packets, and a variety of tools, radio elements, and cargo ship parts and the railroads moved millions of military personnel and uncountable tons of war material across the country. Of course, the largest contribution made by Nebraska was in foodstuffs. Butter, flour, grain alcohol, a long list of dehydrated items, and meat. Omaha became the second largest meatpacking center in the world. This was also an era that changed forever the role of Nebraska's female population. Women drove streetcars and buses, ran offices, welded machine parts, and staffed war plants. Nowhere was their presence more evident than at the busy Martin Bomber plant. Everybody was getting into defense work one way or another, and I'm sitting there tr selling ready-to-wear to women. It made no difference whether they bought a dress or not. I thought, 
this, this is not good. So I went out there in um, the October 42. I decided I was going to go out and see if I could get a job out there. They said they were going to be training people at Tech High School. If you're interested, go on out to Tech. So I took a streetcar. <laughs> we didn't even have a car in our family, so I took a streetcar to Tech High School, which was a ways for me. I uh, rode the streetcar and buses. So I applied, and they took me, and they told me they would train me to read blueprints and also be a riveter. Most of the women who came to the Martin plant were unfamiliar with technical work, so at first, men were doing most of the heavy installation. But as more and more men went into the service, these tasks, too, fell to the women workers. I worked in the wing section, and they were the icebox rivets, and we had the hot ones and the icebox ones. But the icebox ones were the ones that they really checked because they would crack very easy if you didn't use them as quickly as you should. We also had inspectors check every rivet we put in that airplane wing. When a problem did come up and the men were not too happy with what I had suggested, I would just take the blueprint out and I would show them exactly on the blueprint what they were doing wrong, what they missed, what, they, what, what was supposed to have been done that didn't get done, well, of course, what could they say? Yeah, you know, I think you're right. And then they'd go along. Sometimes the feminine touch came in handy. And I remember one time when I had a run in something, that was, whether it was a hose or a piece of, of fabric that I was working on where there was a run, and I thought, I'm not going to throw that away. There's some way I can use that to stop it. So I went ahead and took a little bit of nail polish, ap applied it to the end of the run. It didn't run anymore. And it worked out fine. And I thought, well, now, why won't that work, something like that work, on metal? I wrote a report and explained, drew exactly what I had in mind for the shop to do. Uh, they were to drill a hole at the end of that crack, which would eliminate the crack from running on further, and then putting a patch over that for support, uh, for strength. And it worked out well. At its peak of production, 40% of the Martin Bomber plant employees were women. Nationally, six and a half million women worked in defense plants. In addition, there were more than 350,000 women in uniform. Women's Army Corps members, or WACs, served wherever the Army was, as did Navy WAVES. Women Air Force Service Pilots, or WASPs, ferried military aircraft all over the world. Coast Guard SPARs, derived from their Latin motto, of Semper Paratus, or Always Ready, served within most areas of the Coast Guard, and women Marines performed a wide variety of jobs. The news from the battlefronts was more positive. The tide had begun to turn. The Germans were defeated in Russia and North Africa, the Allies were moving through Italy, and the Japanese Empire was rapidly shrinking. Soldiers in these and many other places around the world were entertained and kept somewhat informed by reading the Stars and Stripes and Yank. News of the war, sports, comics, what was happening back in the States and of course pinups were all eagerly looked forward to. As popular as the Stars and Stripes and Yank were, the letter, regular or the convenient little V-mail packet, was the communication lifeline with family and loved ones. Mail call was the most important daily activity, if you had something waiting for you. A v mail I received in as little as two or three days from the middle part of America in France in, in under conditions that you wouldn't normally suspect. On the other side of the coin, it may take another month uh, for a letter to get to you, or certainly a package. We had a kid by the name of Sam Matthews whose mother always baked him cookies and cakes. We could count on his packages coming in about five weeks after she wrote him, told him it was on the way. I never got any mail the entire time I was over there because the month that we're on the lines, we were moving pretty fast. And then as a prisoner, I didn't get any mail, but my fiance, now my wife, wrote me every day anyway, and she sent them. And they all came back eventually at the end of the war. 
Another morale booster for the troops was the USO, which sponsored shows here and overseas with such headliners as Abbott and Costello, Mickey Rooney, and Betty Grable. USO canteens and hospitality corps centers were the home away from home for those in service. While it was not a USO facility, the canteen at North Platte was the busiest in the country. Located next to the railroad station, between six and eight million troops passed through during World War II. They stopped to sample the donuts and coffee or the sandwiches, rest, write letters, dance, or find a shoulder to cry on. The canteen got its start by accident when a group of local women went to the North Platte train station. It started as they were going to meet a train of North Platte boys that was supposed to be coming through and they got all ready to serve them this food and everything and when the train came through that night it happened to be uh, a troop train of other soldiers and it wasn't North Platte's troop train coming through but they served the food anyway and they decided to go on with it. That's the way the canteen started. It was just supposed to be just a, a one-time thing at first. Word spread quickly about how much the soldiers had appreciated the food, and soon volunteers were on hand whenever a train came through. But if there was a troop train coming in at night, the women went, was there. They was there with hot coffee, with sandwiches, with cookies, and they were there to, and fruit, and the, the, the merchants in the town donated milk, donated fruit, and we farm women that were living on farms, we would cook chickens and take chicken meat in, and we made chicken salad sandwiches, and it was all fresh food when it came through. Some of the trains come through, they wouldn't have time to stop for the soldiers to get off. We'd go out to the trains with, with baskets of food. When the canteen was busiest, serving one day's visitors required a mountain of food, including 185 pounds of cooked meat, just as many loaves of bread, 260 dozen cookies, over 1,000 donuts, 23 quarts of ice cream, 825 bottles of milk, and 28 birthday cakes. They said they had a birthday, it was always a birthday cake ready for that person. One lady in North Platte at one time had baked over 100 birthday cakes. And you know, we still get letters from veterans that had gone through North Platte you felt like you were helping. You were felt like that was your part you could do. But uh, we were just happy to do it. We were just happy to see the smiles on those fellows' faces. Other Nebraskans found their ways to contribute. Everyone was urged to buy war bonds. The national drive to save scrap was started by the Omaha World Herald, and the newspaper won a Pulitzer Prize for that effort. Anything that could be converted into war material was collected. Youngsters, styling themselves junior commandos, picked up everything from steel to cigarette and gum wrappers. While foodstuffs were channeled to the military and our allies, Nebraskans started Victory Gardens. It's been estimated that Omaha alone had 30,000 Victory Gardens during the four-year conflict. It was the in thing, uh, but it was, the produ it was production of food. Um, production of food is enormously important in time of war. It was probably, it could have been psychological. Um, and I think to some extent it might have been, but the, the, there were shortages and, and anything that could be produced was important. There were other visible signs of the war, funerals, memorials, and newspaper announcements indicating someone had been killed in the fighting. And there were reminders that death could come closer to home. In September 1943, a B-25 medium bomber aborted its takeoff from Fort Crook. It crashed into the roof of the Martin Bomber plant and burst into flames, killing three crew members and injuring a fourth. Miraculously, the crash occurred at lunchtime. I brown bagged it that day, and it was during our lunch hour. Everybody was off the floor. All the workers were gone. And I had uh, chosen to seat myself at uh, one of the tables a little bit further in the rear, where it was away from the main, the, the regular assembly floor. 
And all of a sudden, I hear this great big crash. Woo. I thought, that plane is coming off a low. You know, and well, it came low. Not only did it come low, it came through. And uh, ironically, we lost a few of the, the, we've lost the people that were on the plane. Nobody on the floor was around to get hurt. Uh, it did come down through one of the light monitors, uh, which uh, letting sunlight in, it wasn't very substantial to stop a missile like that. But uh, uh, there, there were, uh, they were lucky there were very few people in the plant at that time. Again, they cleaned the wreckage away and, and remanufactured the risk system, and they were back online. Being able to maintain production didn't go unnoticed. In April of 1943, the plant was visited by President Roosevelt, accompanied by Nebraska Governor Griswold and Glen L. Martin. In December of 1943, the War Department selected the Martin, Nebraska facility to receive the Army-Navy E Production Award. Given for 12 consecutive months of on-schedule production, the E stood for excellence. Unfortunately, agriculture in Nebraska couldn't make the same claim. By the early spring of 1943, the lack of adequate farm labor had become critical for much of Nebraska. Businessmen from towns and cities helped with harvests, and many women helped fill the gap, but the labor crisis continued to worsen. Between military enlistments, National Guard unit activations, and higher paying industrial jobs in the larger cities, the labor base needed to operate and support agriculture was drying up, just as the crops had in the 1930s. One area hit especially hard was Phelps County. Labor was desperately needed in this area, and the uh, local farmers and the business people got together and attempted to get uh, something out here to help, some form of camp. And uh, Carl Curtis, who was a congressman from this area at that time, suggested that a conscientious objector camp for uh, men who were not uh, going into military service for religious reasons felt that that would be a good chance uh, for this area. The Army quickly investigated the Holdridge area and decided to build a camp, not for conscientious objectors, but for German POWs. The idea of having uh, prisoners of war, particularly German prisoners of war, uh, in our midst here, one would think would be very unsettling. But I think that the uh, need for labor probably overrode that. Construction started on the 320-acre prison camp at Atlanta. It was much larger than neighboring Holdridge, the largest town in Phelps County. Built at a cost of $2 million by Peter Kiewit and Sons, the compound was enclosed by barbed wire and watchtowers. It was nearly self-sufficient with its own farm and livestock, bakery, chapel, theater, and newspaper. By early November, Camp Atlanta was essentially complete and final preparations were made to receive prisoners. The first 250 residents of Camp Atlanta, captured in North Africa, arrived in January of 1944. Due to the terms of the Geneva Convention and wanting to ensure good treatment for American POWs the Germans were holding, the prisoners' living conditions were essentially the same as those of their American guards. So we got whole milk. We hadn't seen whole milk for years in, in the German army. We got half a cup of water in Africa. That was about it. And and cheese in a tube, like a like uh, toothpaste. You squeeze it out and put on your whatever you had. To. So we we lived real well. By the end of January 1944, the number of prisoners exceeded 1,000 and was continuing to grow. Atlanta, Scotts Bluff, and Fort Robinson were base camps, each designed to accommodate 3,000 POWs. A number of smaller satellite sites were attached to the base camps. The best estimates that we have on Camp Atlanta's uh, uh, role in all of this uh, was that with Atlanta and its 18 branch camps ranging from one end of Nebraska to uh, the other in southern Nebraska and down into Kansas, their uh, number of the records of nearly 100,000 German prisoners were processed through Camp Atlanta. 
In addition to the prisoner population, Camp Atlanta housed a U.S. military staff of 600 and approximately 150 civilian workers. Byron and Lois Nelson were part of that civilian staff. He is a fireman, she is a secretary. I started working in the provost marshal office. His secretary was sick and I took her place. And then after she came back, I went to work in the sick and wounded office at the hospital. We had one uh, POW there that spoke English and he did all the, the uh, communicating for us between the, the prisoners and us if we couldn't understand what they were saying. As a whole, they were treated quite well, for prisoners anyway, and uh, I think they appreciated it. And then most of them were like to, uh, our, to, they were interested in finding out our style of living. Soon the POWs began working on farms. These first people we had, uh, uh, they were under guard. They had two guards with uh, M1 carbines. But then uh, when we started getting them on the, uh, in the farms, the uh, restrictions were relaxed. And the first few days they were out, they checked once a day. And uh, after about a week or so, we never saw any, any personnel from the Army at all. And there's no problem. In addition to getting out of the compound, the prisoners received other incentives if they worked. There was a substantial pay difference uh, uh, if the prisoners decided to uh, work uh, as opposed to just staying in their uh, confinement, in their barracks. Uh, it was 10 cents per day if they uh, did not work, and it was uh, 80 cents per day if they did. The prisoners were paid in scrip that was only good at the PX in their compound. They could get most, most things in some cases, particularly cigarettes, uh, were rationed to the American public and were readily available uh, to the German POWs. That was not common knowledge among Americans, or there probably would have been more outcry at that time than what there was. As farmers and POWs worked together, the notion that they were enemies seemed to fade. This painting of POWs being returned to Camp Atlanta after work shows one prisoner with a pie given to him by the farmer's wife. When they came, they had, uh, for the three men, they had one quart of coffee, I think a, one slice or maybe two slices of bread, white bread, and a slice of minced ham, and, and an orange, possibly, or a banana. And, uh, and they were so hungry, they would eat this about 9 o'clock. So at, uh, at noontime, we would feed them. And uh, we bent the rules. We took them in the house and fed them. Some of the POWs spoke English, but misunderstandings still happened. The farmer picked us up in the morning. He said, I said, what are we going to do today? Well, he said, we're going to shoot pigs. And the way we ran into people, we didn't think he knew what he was talking about because we were not supposed to shoot anything. And when we got there, we had to give him a shot. We had to catch all those little pigs, and he would stand there with his vaccination gun, and we hold the pig, and he would give him the shot, and that was the shooting pigs. <laughs> In their spare time, the prisoners formed orchestras, put on stage performances, and organized soccer teams, allowing them to maintain their German heritage. All of these things uh, possibly could have brought uh, criticism if they had been widely known by the general public, but there was a very good reason for that. Busy men are not troublemakers, and they kept them busy. Many of the POWs sent to Nebraska seem to have realized how different things could have been. Well, I think if they would have had a choice, it had been surprising how many would have stayed here, especially those that were going to go back to the Eastern Zone. Is, uh, I think they realized that the Russians weren't going to be very nice to them. Of the 630,000 German prisoners taken in World War II, half were held in American camps. The Germans had 90,000 American prisoners and the Japanese had 15,000.
It was the summer of 1944. The Allies landed in Italy and Rome fell on June 4th. Then came one of the most remarkable military operations in history, the D-Day June 6th landing in Normandy, France. The Luftwaffe was swept from the skies by 12,000 Allied planes. 5,000 naval vessels, from battleships to landing craft, carried some 130,000 troops to five different beachheads on French soil. One beach was named Omaha. Bombs made in Mead were delivered to the enemy, some by B-26s built at the Martin, Nebraska plant, and naval artillery shells from Hastings softened up German defenses. A thousand transports dropped paratroopers to secure the flanks and beach exits. Many of them had trained at Scott's Bluff and Alliance. Overwhelming Allied land, sea, and air power, along with some very good luck, allowed the invasion forces to largely counter German defensive preparations. British troops occupied Sword and Gold beaches. Canadian forces took Juneau, and the U.S. 4th Division landed at Utah, all with relative ease. Omaha Beach was a different story. Soldiers of the U.S. 1st and 29th Infantry Divisions, plus Army Ranger units, ran right into large numbers of German troops, well entrenched behind strong fortifications. Those who survived would not easily forget the costly landing. There were several messages that came over the PA system on the ship. Those messages, I guess I'll never forget, and they're going to linger with me for a long time. Rangers, man your station. And that was simply a command to go down the side of the ship on rope ladders and get into the bobbing and weaving landing craft. All boats away meaning that we left the side of the ship and went out into a rendezvous area in the water. And the last message that I vividly remember coming from the PA system on the ship. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When my company reached the beach, it was about H plus 40 minutes. And uh, it was a pretty desolate uh, scene. Uh, we felt like we were simply all alone on that beach. We could see no troops. Uh, the only troops that we could see were dead troops, bodies of soldiers uh, on the beach, uh, some floating around in the water. Uh, the beach at that time was a, a desolate place. Uh, it, was, it was pretty much like hell, if you will. The only thing that you could do to stay alive on that beach was to get off of it. And the only way that you could get off of that beach was to keep going forward, and that's what we did. It was the only option that we had to us. Arnold's Rangers got off the beach and out of the deadly German fire as fast as they could, but half of his 60 men were gone. Eventually, U.S. forces gained the upper hand at Omaha Beach, along with the other four Normandy landing sites. The Germans, taken by surprise, were driven back. The Allies had secured their beachheads. Some 2,000 Americans died taking Omaha. Replacements brought the unit's manpower back up to what it had been, but the impact of the D-Day losses was felt long after June 6th. As the Allies moved slowly inland from Normandy, a steady stream of supplies and soldiers poured across the channel from Great Britain. The D-Day gains were only the beginning. A lot of intense combat lay ahead. Among the numerous reinforcements sent to France was the 35th Infantry Division and its Nebraska National Guard units. Landing at Omaha Beach July 5, 1944, one month after the D-Day invasion, the 35th Division moved inland. On July 13th, the 134th received its first mission and moved to the front lines. The objective was the German communication and transportation hub of St. Lowe. 
The town was supposed to have been taken nine days after D-Day. The Allies couldn't break out of the Normandy beachhead area without first capturing it. The strongest German defenses in the St. Lowe area were atop Hill 122 north of the town. Heavy and accurate artillery fire controlled from this high ground had caused nearly 1,000 casualties in three unsuccessful attempts at taking the hill by the 29th Division. The 134th Regiment was ordered to relieve elements of the 29th Division and capture Hill 122. On July 15, 1944, Colonel Butler B. Miltenberger, the 134th commander, started his assault. After two days of fierce fighting and nearly 800 casualties, the 134th controlled Hill 122. By July 18th, elements of the regiment were on the outskirts of St. Lo and began to clear the town. The Corps commander responsible for the sector wanted the 29th Division to get credit for the capture of St. Lo since it had been one of their D-Day objectives. The 134th was ordered out of St. Lo. A large press corps contingent accompanied the 29th Division elements into St. Lo. Reporters on the scene wrote of how the 29th had captured the town, but no mention was made of what the 134th had done. Among the press was Omaha World Herald war correspondent Lawrence W. Youngman. He was aware of the 134th's contribution to the battle and wrote an article entitled, 134th Enters City First, Others Get Credit. Youngman had convinced a skeptical Henry Dorley, publisher of the Omaha World Herald, to send him to Europe to cover soldiers from Nebraska and western Iowa, especially the 134th. Youngman became one of more than 1,600 accredited American correspondents with the rank of captain. Colonel Miltenberger assigned a jeep and a driver, Private John Robidoux of Falls City. He covered many aspects of the war in Europe, including the Allies' triumphal entry into Paris, but his main interest lay with the 134th, as the regiment fought its way across Europe. Youngman spent his days at the front, in hospitals, in bivouac areas, searching out boys from Nebraska and Iowa, interviewing them and taking their pictures. These hometown stories and photos, some mailed and some wired back to the World Herald, became one of the newspaper's most popular features and actually increased circulation. Colonel Miltenberger also credited Youngman with greatly improving the morale of the 134th. The World Herald had planned on leaving him in Europe until the Germans surrendered, but after five months under difficult conditions, Youngman's eyes began to give him trouble and the medics sent him home in December of 1944 just before the Battle of the Bulge, the most costly action of World War II. Up until December of 1944, people in Nebraska were talking about having the boys home in a few months. The Bulge changed all of that. The Germans launched a last-ditch offensive that caught several American divisions by surprise. The end of the war suddenly looked far away. By mid-January 1945, the German offensive in the Ardennes was contained. The Allies were rolling once again in Europe. 
The Thousand Year Reich had less than 100 days left. In mid-1944, the Martin, Nebraska plant delivered its 1,585th and final V-26. The Marauder fought in all theaters of the war and set many records in the process. Most impressive was its loss in combat ratio of one half of one percent, the lowest of any Allied bomber. Production immediately switched to the B-29 bomber under license from Boeing. This massive aircraft was able to carry a large bomb load over the extremely long distances required in the Pacific. Of four plants producing B-29s, only Martin, Nebraska was turning out planes ready to go into service. From Pacific Island air bases, the giant bomber's long-range capability was taking the war to the Japanese home islands. Best known as the plane that dropped the atomic bombs, the B-29 was an innovative design for its time. Well, to me, the B-29 was the best aircraft we had in, in the Air Corps at the time. I would fly through any weather in the B-29. The pressurized cabins, which was a, a, a nice little bonus so we didn't have to suck on our oxygen masks when we were going to our, our bombing altitude over the Japanese Empire. But it was a, a real stable aircraft and one I enjoyed flying very much. O'Levy was a member of the 509th Composite Group, commanded by Colonel Paul W. Tibbetts, Jr. The unit was secretly training to carry the atomic bomb. In the summer of 1944, the Martin, Nebraska plant was selected to make the modifications required for Tibbetts' aircraft to carry atomic bombs. Martin engineers estimated they could do the required work in six weeks without slowing normal B-29 production. Tibbetts and his crews came to the Martin, Nebraska plant to personally take delivery of the aircraft they would use. The thing that really was exciting to us is the fact that when uh, Colonel Tibbet came through and decided that the B-29s that he wanted to use on his mission were the ones that were coming from our plant. That when we picked them up here in, in Omaha, we felt that uh, we had a, a leg up on, on everybody else because we came actually to the factory to pick up our own aircraft and how many people get to do that. So of course, uh, w when the crew gathered, they, and they'd say, well, that's your aircraft there coming off the line. And uh, it, it made you feel good that uh, you could see all these things that were going on around you. We had the uh, latest fuel injection engines and we had the only reversible props that were in the Air Corps at that time, back in 1945. So we had the latest state of the art to give us the best advantage that we could have flying missions against the Japanese Empire. Martin, Nebraska engineers and plant workers knew only that modifications for carrying an unusually large bomb were needed. They had no idea what effect the special B-29s would have. As the atomic bomb was being tested and the Allies were racing toward Berlin, the nation was deeply saddened by the death of President Roosevelt on April 12th. With the success of Lawrence Youngman, the Omaha World Herald dispatched another correspondent, Bill Bellotti, to the Pacific. Covering the war was the biggest assignment a journalist could get, but that didn't keep Bellotti's wife from worrying about him. She knew how badly I wanted to have a piece of it, and uh, she, she said, you would be careful over there and all that stuff. She would, uh, uh, she could tell by the date lines on my stories where I was, and She'd see Okinawa, something like that. She'd drive me a letter, stay out of there, you don't need to be. <laughs> Bellotti arrived in Manila in late March of 1945. Three days later, he was in the combat zone on patrol. Like Youngman, Bellotti wanted to tell the story of the war through the experiences of regular soldiers. 
To get his information, he searched for Nebraskans, Iowans, and Dakotans wherever he went. I was kind of wondering if it wouldn't be real tough to find them. I was surprised how it wasn't easy, but it wasn't hard because these soldiers tell each other where they're from or that, and they'd, I'd ask them and they'd tell me. I, I didn't have much trouble at all. Correspondents weren't supposed to be armed, but Bellotti carried a carbine and a 45 on the advice of the more experienced journalists. I don't know I'd ever hit anybody with it, but if I was on a patrol with somebody and they were shooting, I'd shoot right along with them. Yeah? Bellotti carried a camera and a typewriter with him into the field, but frequently left them at base camps preferring to take notes and then complete the stories later. Getting the information back home from Manila was the biggest challenge. I still have dreams to this day where I've got all this copy and I can't get it off the island. You know, uh, this is a long time back, but it, that was one of the tougher things. Another Nebraska journalist, WOW Radio's Ray Clark, made history by broadcasting live during a bombing run over Japan. This is George Thomas Foster reporting from fleet headquarters on Guam. Seven task forces of B-29s, the 20th Air Force, left the Marianas base today to strike in the early morning darkness of the 29th of July at six Japanese cities and an oil refinery on the Isle of Honshu. War correspondent Ray Clark is flying in one of the B-29s, the city of Omaha. So, for an eyewitness account, we take you to Ray Clark over the target at this moment. This is Ray Clark on the flight deck of the Super Fortress City of Omaha, almost ready to head in on the bomb run on the city of Ogaki, Japan. His uh, purpose in going out there in the first place was to to find and interview any uh, uh, Heartland people, you know, to uh, interview them so their folks could hear their voices. And, and uh, of course, that, the parents seemed to like that. I mean, it was something that helped the morale, he felt. I first met Ray after he uh, had found out that uh, there was a city of Omaha, a B-29, and uh, he wanted to, uh, as a war correspondent, tape an interview with us that he could send back to the States, to W.O.W., and, uh, and uh, that he had interviewed the crew that was flying, uh, and a B-29 called the city of Omaha. So after he made this tape recording, he then s said he would like to make a flight with us. And uh, I thought this was, uh, pushing, and I said, Ray, I don't think you really want to go on a combat mission, but he said, no, I really want to go on one, and not only that, uh, I want to, I want to, I want to make a, a broadcast right off in the flight deck of an actual bomb run. The 20th Air Force approved Ray's request for the broadcast, and he prepared for the mission. The target was the industrial city of Ogaki, Japan. As I recall, the only thing he brought along was a big, what did you call it, a dynamic microphone. And uh, as I recall, that's, that's all he had with him. It had a good long extension cord on it so it could be plugged into my transmitter. And uh, we went from there. With Ray aboard the city of Omaha, the B-29s departed on their long flight to Ogaki. Making the first direct broadcast of an actual bomb run. Ahead of us through the darkness, for it's now about 2.30 over Japan. Ahead of us through that darkness, we can see at this hour the two targets which are already on fire. From the plane, the signal went to Guam, requiring a special long range antenna. From there, it was rebroadcast to the States. I was told uh, after the broadcast was over, but before I, I signed off from Guam, that the broadcast had been carried live by three networks here in the States and 
recorded for rebroadcast later by two others. We see some of the flights of that flight coming up, however, and uh, of course the bombardier's job is to go up right over that target, regardless of whether there is any flak or not. Bombs away, there they go, and it's quite lift to the plane as we feel those bombs uh, leave us. Of course, we are now directly above that target. We cannot tell uh, exactly what happened uh, from those individual bombs. We can see from what has happened to the others that uh, the bomb is dead for our destruction. This is Ray Clark uh, speaking from the flight deck of a B-29 city of Omaha over the target of Ogaku and now leaving that target for home. I'll return you to San Francisco. As Ray Clark and the city of Omaha were making broadcast history over Japan, the war in Europe was coming to a close. Allied soldiers took Berlin, Hitler committed suicide, and the German high command surrendered. General Alfred Jodl signed the surrender documents at Eisenhower's headquarters in Reims, France. He looked at the surrender terms. This is at 2 o'clock in the morning. He said, uh, no country under God has suffered as much, has won as much, and has lost as much, and has been pained and has been hurt as much as the German people. He said, into the hands of the victors, I sign away my country, and he signed it. May 8, 1945 became the historical VE, or Victory in Europe Day. The delirium felt in Europe and America, including celebrations in the streets of Omaha and Lincoln, was tempered by the knowledge that we still had a war to win in the Pacific and was sobered by the information now emerging from the continent about the incredible slaughter of a whole people, the attempted genocide aimed at Europe's Jewish population. As with citizens everywhere, Nebraskans were stunned by the photos coming from camps like Dachau and Buchenwald that gave horrific proof of the extermination of six million Jews, along with others considered undesirable. In the Pacific, U.S. forces were closing on the last Japanese strong points outside the home islands. Nearly 7,000 American servicemen died conquering Iwo Jima, and 18,000 more were wounded. More than 50,000 U.S. casualties, including 12,000 killed, were suffered taking Okinawa as over 100,000 Japanese soldiers fought to the death. Everyone was anticipating massive casualties on both sides in the inevitable assault on the Japanese mainland. As the Allies pressed Japan to surrender before an invasion was necessary, Colonel Tibbetts' 509th Composite Group was on Tinian Island preparing to use the atomic bomb. And they showed us a film of the actual explosion of, of the, the uh, bomb at Trinity in uh, New Mexico. So of course we had some idea of, of uh, what it looked like, but we had no idea of, of, of course, in our mind's eye as to what the the devastation it could cause. On July 26, 1945, the Japanese were given the choice of unconditional surrender or face complete destruction. When the Japanese government refused to surrender, President Truman agreed to the use of America's awesome atomic weapon. On August 6, 1945, the Omaha-built B-29 Enola Gay commanded by Colonel Tibbetts, took off from Tinian in the Marianas. A uranium bomb was detonated over Hiroshima. Estimates are that between 70 and 80,000 people died, and at least that many more were injured. Still, the Japanese government refused to surrender. On August 9th, a second atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Fred O'Levy co-piloted the B-29, which dropped the second bomb. In the 60s, uh, I received letters from people that I didn't know, of course, and some telephone calls calling me a murderer and uh, uh, asking why I did something like that. And, uh, you know, just the, the general consensus that we shouldn't have dropped the two bombs and or. 
after the war was over, and uh, they started to show us pictures of uh, the disaster, you know, like like uh, uh, these bodies that were laying after the, the, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, uh, what, what terrible destruction, how many lives were lost. Then I got to feeling guilty. I was part of that. I helped build that plane that carried that bomb, that dropped that bomb. I was, I was having second thoughts. And to the point where at night, I was having nightmares. But had we not have dropped this bomb, so much more could have happened. So many more lives would have been lost. We had, we had, we had to do it. It was not a matter, well, should we do it or is there another alternative? There was no other alternative. We had to do it. In my estimation, if we had to fight our way in, the cost for both sides would have been astronomical. On August 10th, the day after the Nagasaki mission, the Japanese agreed to discuss capitulation. The official surrender took place on September 2nd on the battleship USS Missouri. Bill Bellotti was there. As far as you could see was our battle wagons all lined up and then uh, when MacArthur said these proceedings are over, planes after planes after planes came over. And the Japanese would stand there. Finally, they, they just looked up. They couldn't keep themselves watching this. Finally, after four years, it was over. Like everywhere across the country, Nebraska celebrated. Amazingly, U.S. industry produced nearly 300,000 aircraft during the war. When hostilities ended, so did the need. On September 18, 1945, the Martin, Nebraska plant ended production when the 531st B-29 came off the line. The facility had compiled the longest unscheduled production record of any aircraft manufacturing plant in the country. 33 months without a missed delivery. The government-owned facility was mothballed and eventually became the first headquarters of the Strategic Air Command. Most of the military airfields in Nebraska were declared surplus. The Lincoln Airfield became an Air Force base. Others were made available to the neighboring communities and became municipal airports. The airfields at Bruning, Harvard, and Fairmont became state airports and are currently operated by the Nebraska Department of Aeronautics. Camp Atlanta was declared surplus property by the War Department in early January of 1946, but some 208,000 POWs were still in the United States, and it would be July before they were all gone. Today, about all that remains of Camp Atlanta is the chimney from the hospital heating plant. Many POWs wanted to remain in the United States, but first they had to return to their home country and apply for re-entry to the U.S. Receiving approval to come back was a long process. So it took four years before all the paperwork was done. At that time, the, you had to be denazified. De they had to check all your party records that you were not a member before they even considered you to come to the United States. It took five years to live here and then you could apply for citizenship. And uh, so in, in October 1955, I became a citizen here. Most POWs returned and stayed in their homeland. Some scholars credit German POWs returning from internment in the United States with the rapid growth of democracy in that divided nation. The fact that Germany has now been a democratic nation uh, for 50 years or nearly that, uh, is a very, very good indication that much of what the POWs took home was of a very positive nature and certainly helped international relations a great deal. Troop movement across the country remained heavy as millions of soldiers returned home. The North Platte Canteen continued to serve them, remaining open until April of 1946. 
the ones coming back, some of them were joyful, some of them were very quiet. Wouldn't talk much about it. Still glad to see us. And could not believe when they walked in and would see the tables of food, home cooked food, or home prepared food. It was heartwarming. The GIs came home, different. And they came back to a different country. From a pre-war rating as the world's 13th most powerful nation, the United States was the most powerful. Each veteran had a personal story to tell and an individual approach to civilian life. The thing that I guess impressed me about the whole conflict is how easily the people who'd fought this war merged back into society. The returning GIs also changed the employment picture for women. We felt men had to work. They were men. So that didn't bother us at all to give up our jobs. At that time, I didn't realize just what was going to be involved. So I worked at the uh, Brandeis department store for about maybe a year. And then I decided it was time. We were, we were long enough. We waited. We were going to start raising our little family. So I cut it off, stayed home, raised a family, and he kept on working. A major change in America occurred in higher education. President Roosevelt had signed a bill into law in 1944 that provided educational opportunities for veterans based on their length of service. This became known as the GI Bill and initially cost five and a half billion dollars. Skeptics thought few veterans would take advantage of this opportunity, but they were wrong. Some 2.2 million men and women entered or continued college. Many consider it one of the most successful government programs ever enacted. Nebraska's agricultural future also altered dramatically, with many more young men getting college degrees before returning to the farm. New technology, touching every aspect from advanced herbicides and irrigation to sophisticated mechanization, revolutionized farm labor, crop yields, and contributed to the trend toward fewer but larger farms. Post-war farm income reached all-time highs in Nebraska, exceeding a billion dollars for the first time. Production kept pace with these boom years. In Nebraska cities, the population also shot up. 20% in Lincoln, over 12% in Omaha, and Hastings' population grew by more than a third. Improving the state's highways became a priority, along with taming the Missouri and Platte rivers, and irrigated acres in Nebraska increased dramatically. What Nebraska is today, and what this country is, relates back to that 1940s conflict. It was a watershed event. Today, most of those who lived through the war as adults are retired, some are ailing, and the ranks grow thinner every year. Less than half of Nebraska's World War II veterans are still alive. Some attend reunions of their old units or remain members of various veterans organizations, but the majority are simply anonymous senior citizens. In 1995, Nebraska hosted a series of events aimed at commemorating the end of the Second World War and thanking those who had served at home and abroad. Among the many activities was a reunion and recognition ceremony for former Martin Bomber plant employees. Another highlight of the celebration was a special Union Pacific train carrying veterans and their families from Omaha to North Platte and back. For the passengers, it recreated journeys to boot camp, basic training, overseas assignments, or the departure and return of loved ones. And a parade in downtown Omaha brought together people who lived through the conflict with those who had never heard of it. For the thousands of onlookers who cheered, laughed, and shed tears, it was a reminder of how an entire state had answered the call when the war came to Nebraska. As one veteran put it, after 50 years, you felt like you'd finally had your parade.
Funding for The War Comes to Nebraska was provided by the Victory 95 World War II 50th Anniversary Commemorative Celebration Program.